one of the key things is um, to think about the clinical presentation. Ankle injuries, ankle sprains come in all flavors. The typical thing is you see this in your clinic, and actually what is likely to have happened before is something like this. But so here we are. We can see that the most typical injury is an inversion injury where the lateral ligaments um, are sprained. Now, how do we think about this? History is usually quite clear. These are traumatic injuries, certainly in the acute setting. So the first thing that we start off with is looking at the ankle. Here is uh, an ankle. You can look on the medial side. The bruising can be extensive. It can be on the medial side and on the lateral side. Also look at the posterior aspect of the calf. Occasionally injuries can be accompanied uh, with injuries to the calf muscle and you can see bruising there. Then we feel you have to point and palpate various structures. And the things that we're trying to palpate here, we have the. Um, so here we have the antralateral aspect of the ankle joint. You can see the tailored dome, the plafond. This structure here, number one, is the fibula. So we're looking at the front of the ankle on the right hand image and we're looking at the posterior aspect of the ankle on the left hand image. Here, green is identifying the two uh, bands of the ATFL, the uh, anterior talar fibula ligament. Here we have the calcaneo fibula ligament that you can see both on the posterior view and on the lateral view and then the posterior Taylor fibula ligament. Of these two more important ones are the um, ATFL and the CFL. So when we go around palpating, it's with respect to having knowledge of this uh, anatomy. So you've got the antralateral portion of the Taylor dome, the ATFL itself, and usually you can see in patients who have got uh, injury to their ankle, this is the area where you've got synovitis, there is a bit of puffing in the ankle base of the metatarsal. When you have inversion injuries, you can have accompanied injuries such as fracture of the base of the fifth metatarsal. So it's important to, uh, to have a palpation there. Medial side can also be injured. The medial malleolus we've got on the left-hand side is the um, tailor part of it. And on the right-hand side is the malleolar part insertion of the ligament. Deeper inside the instep, we have the spring ligament. Then we want to think about moving the ankle and both the static sort of examination as well as the dynamic. So as well as looking at the range of movement of the various joints, what I want to demonstrate are some particular tests that we do to look for ankle instability. Now here we can see that we're looking at the antralateral aspect of the ankle joint. That's my hand behind the heel and the other hand holding the anterior aspect of the tibia. And here we are slowly moving the ankle and you can see that a sulcus actually appears as the talus rotates out of the mortise with the um, ATFL. Here we can see a similar sort of thing. So here we are, much the same, my hand behind the heel, hand over the anterior shin. And what we want to look at here is on the medial side, because this uh, individual has injured the medial ligaments. And you can see as I pull the ankle, it is the medial side that opens out. Following the clinical examination, we want to have a look at some imaging. We do x-rays. X-rays are a standard. It is critical that these are weight-bearing images. The ankle is a weight-bearing structure, and actually the instability of the ankle mortis is best seen when these images are load-bearing. So um, x-rays are very good for getting the weight-bearing view. We can see the alignment of the hind foot. We can see if there are any fractures and just the general um, view of the bony anatomy. An ultrasound scan is very useful for dynamic examination. If we want to look at subluxing tendons, if we want to look at, for example, specifically the syndesmosis and how it widens when you put the ankle through various ranges of movement.
whether we can see um, the subluxation of the perineal tendons being a particular one. And they're very, also very good at guiding injections. The MRI scan has really become a standard uh, examination in, in all things foot and ankle. They allow us to look at the soft tissues. We can look at the osteochondral lesions, so we can look at the cartilaginous surface, we can look at the ligaments, and also we can identify occult fractures where we could not see them either on MRI or, sorry, on, on a CT scan or on x-rays. So what are the red flags? What are the things? Because actually the, the vast majority of ankle sprains can be managed very well in the community. But what are the things that we need to think about as being red flags? And we need to think about either doing diagnostics. I think diagnostics are essentially in almost every case, but also thinking about getting a specialist opinion. If they're unable to bear weight, if there is significant swelling around the ankle, if there is deformity that the individual, the patient, tells you wasn't there before, if they feel that things are actually deteriorating and getting worse over a few days till the time that they come and consult you. And the other thing that I always think about is something doesn't quite fit. Your clinical findings are a little bit unexpected. The swelling is in the wrong place. They've got tenderness in places that you wouldn't expect for an ankle sprain. So actually, it's important to, to listen to that and think we need to do something about this. Once we think about the ankle sprain, we want to be able to classify it. As an orthopedic surgeon, um, I feel at home when something is classified. And actually, the, the reason for this is two. One is gives you a waypoint on a spectrum of um, injury that you want to be able to, to think about. It gives you an idea of how that individual will then um, improve so you can predict the improvement pattern and the pattern of progress from the injury. It also allows you to, to think about the pattern of injury. There are things that you may not recognize, but by them being mentioned in a classification system, you can then think about those as something that you will also diagnose, which will have an impact on the patient's outcome. Typical one is the grade one, grade two, grade three. Rubbish. I think this is no good. It doesn't really tell us what we want to know. It's an anatomic based classification. And actually, there are better ways to think about it. What I think about the ankle is a, it's a mechanical structure which has got a function. So you want the mechanical stability, the joint laxity. Is there, are the joints and the bony components of the, of the joint working together properly? And then it's the functional stability, how well that individual is able to control that ankle. And we can think about this actually much more so in the chronic instability picture. So in recurrent instability, we think about the mechanical insufficiency of that ankle, which, which is things like, you know, the joint is a bit stiff, there is or is pathologically lax, there are degenerative changes, there are synovial changes, there are things about the anatomy of the structures around the ankle which are unstable and not working. The other side of it is the functional insufficiency, how well that individual is able to control it, whether they have... Um, impaired postural control, they, they are weak, the proprioception is not very good, or whether they've got poor neuromuscular control. And that impaired proprioception is of particular importance in, in ankle sprain because those ligaments are actually mechanoceptors and they provide huge amount of feedback centrally so that you can um, uh, afford stability to the ankle. So we have to think about the mechanics and we have to think about the function are the two really important things. What about treatment? How do I think about treating this? This is a, this is a consensus um, uh, document, really, really helpful. I think there's lots of things that it talks about. So the general things are non-steroidals are good. They reduce pain. It is important to reduce pain, but they do impair healing. The supervised um, exercise-based programs are really important because there are some things you may not be able to do about the mechanical side, but you can certainly improve the functional side, and one can compensate for the other. And surgery 
is really indicated when rehab has failed. That's a really important thing. I always think about low-hanging fruit. Low-hanging fruit is actually getting the patient to do rehabilitation. The, they also talked about rice. So what is the purpose of this? What does it do? And in fact, the only thing that this really helps with is um, in swelling rather than in the range of movement. So it does control swelling. When we think about uh, non steroidal anti-inflammatories versus placebo, they do improve pain and they do reduce swelling, but none of the other things are affected by it. Interestingly, they didn't show any particular complications with it, but we do know that in a, in a particular group of individuals, they can have renal complications, they can have gastric complications. So it's important to take a history of the patient before you advise them to take any medicines. Immobilization versus functional support. So immobilization is basically in an air cast boot. And that's very good for pain. I regularly put my patients into an air cast boot for anything between seven to 10 days. It mitigates pain. It makes the ankle feel more comfortable. They can get on with their life. It reduces requirement for taking pain relief. However, when we look at the more long-term aspects of outcome, satisfaction, uh, the, the patient reported outcome measures, return to work, and if they just general function, the functional support, which is a stirrup ankle support, I'm going to show you some of those in a minute as well, are actually much better. Also, days to return to sport, again, they need to regain function. They need to have a, a functional support and they need to have rehabilitation. Exercise therapy. It doesn't do anything for your pain. It's painful to exercise but within logical limits, of course. So sensations of instability, both objective and subjective, are improved by this. What we're doing is that we're improving that functional side, which then compensates for the lack of uh, mechanical stability. Also, it is obvious, you exercise, you get back to sports quicker. So for my money, what I do is exclude other pathologies, this is uh, an air cast boot. I use it for a short period of time. I convert them to a stirrup ankle support early under supervision of physiotherapy and early functional rehab. Really critical. If that fails, they go through a combination of examination under anesthesia, arthroscopy of the joint and reconstruction of the appropriate ligament. And it's just to say that at the time, the, the individuals that fail functional rehabilitation actually have multiplicity of other pathologies which become apparent when we examine them and scope their ankle. Um, I'm a big fan of um, anatomic ligament repairs. When the ligament quality is good, we can add other things such as an internal uh, brace when the quality is core. Uh, uh, sorry, the quality, the quality is poor, you cannot rely on the patient or actually they are elite athletes and they want to really accelerate their rehabilitation. Ex the exploration of the perineal tendons is part of my surgical procedure because there are invariably occult perineal tendon uh, issues that we need to deal, deal with. The goals of rehab, Jody is going to be talking about those in a minute, so I'm not really going to go into them very much, and and uh, but but it is essential. Very briefly about syndesmotic injuries. Another thing that we hear about is a high ankle sprain, and the what this study showed was that out of um, a number of ankle sprains, a good sixteen percent are multi-directional in instability, and some of them have medial instability. Some of them have syndesmotic instability and a small proportion have a combination of all of these. So the multi ligamentous injury of the ankle is a real thing. And in a more severe injuries, we do need to think about this. And this could be a reason why some individuals fail their rehabilitation. Just to tell you what the syndesmosis is, here we are. We can see the footprint of the AITFL, the anterior inferior tibia fibula ligament. This is the posterior counterpart. And this portion here is actually the interosseous ligament, the syndesmotic, the, the, the uh, 
tough sheet membrane that goes between the uh, tibia and the fibula. Even the AI TFL has got multiple bands uh, associated with it, the superior and the inferior bands. Here we are. This is uh, looking inside the ankle joint using an arthroscope, and this is my probe moving the fibula. And you can see that in this circumstance, the fibula is actually mobile compared um, to the tibia. Here, looking inside the ankle joint, and you can see that there are fronds of synovium which are hanging into the joint. And these can, again, cause sensations of instability. And as part of um, reconstructing, these uh, fronds need to be excised. So this is just demonstrating the um, arthroscopic removal. So I'm just looking over my colleague's computer because I can I can see how you guys can see it. And I know that it's not quite as smooth uh, as it could be. But you can see that the, um, these, these synovial thickening uh, can, be, can be removed and needs to be removed because this catches inside the joint and, and gives those sensations of instability. So on that, the key thing to remember is that um, the examination of the ankle is quite important. We need to think about multi-ligament instability and other occult injuries when uh, rehabilitation fails. And I think now what I'm going to do is hand over to Jody, who's going to tell us all about how we can rehabilitate. Thank you, Nima. So, hello, everyone. My name's Jodie. And um, for those of you that don't know me, um, I'm National Lead Physio for Nuffield Health. Um, also got a really keen interest in foot and ankle rehab. So I'm on the committee for the Association of Foot and Ankle Physios, which if you're interested in foot and ankle rehab, great groups come and join. We're free. Um, loads of CPD. And it's great to be able to work with the consultants here at BARTS to kind of present this talk to you today. So I'm just going to share my slides okay so i'm kind of focused more on the chronic ankle instability patients i think probably realistically these are more the patients that we see in our clinics you know the acute sprains often we don't get to them unfortunately and we can discuss that um but what i'm going to try and go over is a little bit about the epidemiology of ankle sprains um, one of the models we've got of chronic ankle instability and some guidelines that we have about our clinical assessment of those ankles and then go through what we can do from that in our rehab. So a lateral ankle sprain is one of the, the most common lower limb injuries with a high incidence in our physically active individuals. So a review that looked at loads of incidence data back in 2019 found that between two and seven of every 1,000 A&E visits are for a lat lateral ankle sprain. And I know this, that is actually my ankle. I am one of those people. It was not fun. So, and the other thought is that we think it may be about five and a half times higher than this because how many of us have gone over on our ankles and don't go to A&E? So actually the numbers could be even higher. The economic burden of these injuries is high. So on average, it's 6.9 stays of work can be lost due to lateral ankle sprains. And there is also some evidence out there that um, it may be the lateral ankle sprain can predict 13 to 22% of ankle osteoarthritis, which has got a huge cost in terms of future surgeries, in terms of fusion surgeries or ankle joint replacements and huge disability for our patients. So as physios, we have a real opportunity to try and have impact on this economic burden and improve quality of life for our patients. So if we think about a lateral ankle sprain, those primary inflammatory symptoms settle pretty quickly, don't they? And I think often the public therefore view them as quite an innocuous incident and a lot of them don't seek rehab. However, we do have evidence that up to 70% of individuals will suffer some ongoing symptoms from that and some ongoing disability. Also, the, um, there's a high risk of re-injury in the sporting population and the strongest predictor of those people who are, going to re uh, who are going to injure their ankles are ones that have already injured it in the past as well. So we have a real kind of opportunity to impact this group. And that takes me on to 
this model of chronic ankle instability. Hopefully that comes up large enough on your screen. So this was done by Herbert and Corbett in 2019. So they updated it. There's been lots of models over the years, but this was nicely updated to take further into account the vast number of impairments that these patients may have. And it's summarised in eight different components that are trying to encompass that biopsychosocial. Um, oops, someone's taken over again. There we go. Um, biopsychosocial. Um, here we go. Components of an individual. So looking at environmental and personal factors. So we're going to focus today on the self-organisation factors. OK, so we're going to look at this is combining the pathomechanical, the sensory perceptual and the motor behavioural impairments that Nima were talking about, was talking about it earlier. So you've got your pathomechanical looking at your joint laxity, joint restrictions. So your mechanical instability and then you've got your sensory perceptual looking at balance, pain and fear of movement. And then we've got motor behavioural, which is our motor weakness, altered movement patterns and general reduced activity. And it's not that this model is implying that every single one of your chronic ankle instability patients will present with all of these, but they are impairments that may be present. And if you look at the bottom, the final component of this updated model is looking at the spectrum of outcomes that an individual may experience. So you've got your copers to the far right at the positive end. And then um, this is someone who appears to get on fine after they've had a lateral ankle sprain with no feelings of instability. However, the people that come to us are more towards the left hand side of the spectrum where they're not coping and they are they are presenting to us with chronic ankle instability. And one of the aims of this model was to act for us as a framework as clinicians for how to manage these individuals. So we can identify all the relevant impairments that can then nicely inform our treatment plan. So you can see if we use this framework, it gives us a nice guidance as to where we go with our treatment. But we also have some nice guidelines that also came out in 2019 from the International Ankle Consortium about what we should be looking at, which ties in with this well. But it starts off looking at our history. So just the general framework of it, you need to know your mechanism of injury and also to establish that previous history of lateral ankle sprain so that we know whether it's an, an acute initial injury or more of a chronic ankle instability. So if I look next, so we're going to start with our pathomechanical impairments. So what do we look at? What should we assess? So ankle range of movement. And this is because there is a um, evidence to suggest that a lot of these patients will have a dorsiflexion deficit. And this may be a risk factor. Maybe we don't know for repeated injury. And how might we look at this? So I tend to use knee to wall or um, use the weight bearing lunge test. And I use an inclinometer on my phone. So nice and easily reproducible. Then I'll look at accessory range of movement. So there's also evidence that they have a tailor, um, their tailor bone is not where it should be. So it's got a positional fault. So it's sitting more anterior in the ankle joint. So you're not getting that normal slide backwards of the talus and the mortise or that they've got an anterior place fibula head. So I tend to do that by looking at the posterior glide test. So just applying an AP on the tailor head to see how that moves. And then we've got our ligament tested, as Nima talked about earlier. So looking at our anterior draw test, I tend to use reverse anterior draw test, which we can show you later. Taylor tilt test for the CFL and then our syndesmosis testing. Then we need to look into. More of our motor behavioural impairments, so we need to look at joint muscle strength. And we have, you know, if someone has got impaired strength, it's going to compromise that functional stability, which is what's relevant for our chronic ankle instability patients. And how do we do this? So 
I would love to say that I had handheld dynamometry in my clinic. I don't think many of us do. We would all love it. But really, we just need to use capacity tests. So how many ankle raises can they do? How many resisted um, everters can they do? Just use, just get some numbers down to give you some objective measures of where you want to start. Then I'll look at static balance. Again, consistently found in those with ankle, um, ankle instability. So there's a variety of ones out there. The, um, the, some of these papers recommend using the balance error scoring system. So if, if you haven't come across it before, it's six different conditions. So feet together, standing on one leg and stride stance on both the flat surface and on a balance cushion. And there's all, I mean, that you can go into it in minute detail of counting how many um, errors someone has. So taking their hands off their hip or flexing their hips more than 30 degrees, you know, you can take it. It's very much based for research, really. But it gives you a nice objective measure of static balance. And then my favourite is looking at dynamic balance. So looking at your star excursion balance test. So really simple test to do in clinic. So I tend to use the anterior direction, so more like the Y balance test and just looking at difference between right and left so that it gives you just a scale of how much impairment they've got on their dynamic balance. And then finally, we need to look at the sensory perceptual impairment. So what pain have they got? That can be a simple um, VAS and then what's their normal activity level so this um, the roast guidelines recommended that we use the Tegna activity level scale um, also really key is having an ankle specific outcome measure so that we know that we are having an impact and we're being we've got some eff efficacy with these patients the ones they recommend are the foot and ankle disability measure and the foot and ankle ability measure. They're both really easy to use, both freely available, um, and there's there's lots of evidence that they're nice, valid measures. So if we use that model to assess our patients in our physio clinics, we then will have a nice, focused, individualised rehab plan. So you'll it's, it's not generic across all patients, but you will know what's relevant to your patient. And that will nicely feed into your treatment. There are guidelines out there, and this is from the same guideline that Nima was talking about earlier um, from Verberg in 2018. So the table's just summarising the um, what Nima talked about with us earlier. And then they have much more kind of exercise flow diagram on the right that you can see there which is pretty self-explanatory so i'm going to go through each of those just what i tend to do in clinic so let's think first of all about manual therapy so manual therapy can include mwm so mobilizations with movement so mulligans then we've got high velocity low amplitude thrusts at the ankle as well the picture in the middle and then we've got maitland mobilizations on the far right None of the evidence out there indicates that one is better than any other at the moment. OK, so there's been two systematic reviews recently looking at chronic ankle instability and manual therapy with dorsiflexion as their main outcome measure. So still relatively small numbers of studies, not big because all of these were quite small studies in themselves. So not large numbers of patients, but you can see that they both had kind of moderate effect sizes of improving dorsiflexion range of movement, but very large confidence intervals. So it could be anywhere from having a small effect or in actually in the second paper, a negative effect to a really good effect. So the, the studies were very heterogeneous and yes, it, it wasn't um, not that conclusive as yet. Also, they only looked at immediate or short term effects. We don't have anything, any data so far on longer than that. Also, my point is, does the patient really care if their dorsiflexion is proved? No, they care about whether their function's better. So we don't have a huge amount of evidence on the effect on um, patient reported outcome measures. So does that dorsiflexion range lead to improved function satisfaction? Actually, just hot kind of just a little bit of extra information. I've just completed a systematic review myself on manual therapy for chronic ankle instability with these PROMs, 
it's in review stage at the moment, but essentially it showed it may have a small effect, but it's not reaching that minimal clinically important difference. However, I found no adverse effects of it either. So my conclusion was it could be included in the program as part of a wider treatment plan to give you that immediate pain relief that then can then augment your exercise treatment. So, but I will let you know if it uh, gets published and you can read it and make up your own minds. So what I personally tend to do in clinic is this. So I tend to use, I, I just gravitate towards Maitland's. It's what I was trained in. It just feels comfortable. So I'm using my forearm to maintain that foot and dorsiflexion and then using my web space to apply that AP glide on the talus. And I just do kind of five lots of about a minute on that. And I tend to find that gives them really nice pain relief that then means that my exercise therapy goes better. And I always give them as one of my favorite exercises, dorsiflexion, self-mobilization at home. So it means they're getting that analgesic effect of the joint mobilization themselves, but it's empowering the patients. They're only coming in to see me once every week or couple of weeks at the absolute best so if they can do it at home brilliant so that tends to be how I use it and actually that dorsiflexion self-mobilization has been shown to increase dorsiflexion range in that study done in 2015. So then moving on to exercises so what I tend to do is when they're acute at the beginning or if they're particularly weak, if they've got a chronic ankle instability, I tend to move between starting with isolated strengthening and then working in that I'm integrating it in with the rest of the kinetic chain and then moving up to dynamic. So I've just used this as a bit of an example of what I may do for the everters. So starting with nice, easy TheraBand as strong, you know, I tend to go straight for the strong one as soon as I can, everter strengthening. And then looking at getting them using the reverters during heel raises, double stance to single red, single stance. And then I really quite like doing the band walking, but with the band around the toes to really um, get the vertus going. But also it's really nice. It gets the glutes going as well. So it gets more bang for your buck. And then quickly moving into the dynamic exercises. So lateral hops over hurdles on the flat, bounding side to side. So just I mean, your imagination is your only limitation with those exercises. And which muscles do we need to strengthen? I mean, again, look at your assessment, find what you what you can. But there is some evidence that those with ankle instability have got lateral glutes weakness. I always find that the calf, the gastroc and soleus can do with work. And there is randomly a review of all the impairments found on chronic ankle instability was that they tended to have inverter weakness. So always worth having a look as well as the intrinsics of the foot. And then thinking about balance and proprioception, it's the same thing. You're just taking them through getting a much more challenging. So starting fairly statically, so standing on a balance pad with your eyes closed um, and then moving on to more dynamic. So I particularly like the clock face tends to work quite well or all just getting them to move their centre of mass over that injured foot and then moving to much more dynamic. So jumping plyometrics off the box, hopping and landing, using bozus. And then the final stuff on the far right, when you're getting back to and thinking about your basketball player that's going to get thrown around in the air by um, other players, is doing some perturbation training. You've got to be fairly confident by the time you get in there. <laughs> So overall, what's my rehab tend to look like? So at the top, like Nima said, they're not just an ankle. Make sure that you can advise them on how to maintain their fitness as well. So whether that be cycling, swimming, whatever it is to keep them active. A lot of it is education. There is an awful lot of psychological impact to these injuries they need to have education on regaining their confidence and, and feeling confident in their ankles again and then it's looking at range of movement strength static dynamic balance and in the end very much trying to be sports specific so getting them right to the end of their rehab and how should a patient progress? And I'd say, first of all, look, it's never a perfect linear line. So it's much more like the far right graph rather than the one on the left. It will take time. 
but listen to the patient's symptoms through their rehab. And if it's not progressing as you would be expect, consider, consider other diagnoses. Syndesmosis injuries do take longer. Um, but as I said, don't forget that psychological readiness for going back to play. And I find that I need to give them at least a good three months of rehab once they've been referred by NEMA to physio before I go, no, I don't think this is going to work. I'm not happy. And then send back. It needs that amount of time at least. But thank you. That's the my physio perspective on rehab. That's great. Thank you. Thank you very much. No, it's, it's actually it's really critical. And, and on that particular point, I really do agree with you, because once you start on the rehab path, you do need to carry on for at least three months to really, particularly with a chronic, uh, chronically unstable yeah. ankles. And I think that's the education with the patient. Yeah, yeah. They're not going to get this is not a quick fix. And a lot of it is they think that the operation may be a quick fix, but actually it's like, well, no, you've got all this rehab you'd have to do post-operatively as well. I mean, my, my thing is that, Tom, I'm sure you say the same thing, it is, is that, you know, we get you out of the blocks, but actually to complete the race, you need the, you need the rehabilitation. Yeah. The easy bit of surgery. That's right, that's right. <laughs> so, then, so now what we're going to do is, uh, so Tom Hester, my, my good friend and colleague, expert foot and ankle surgeon, there are circumstances when rehab fails for, for a variety of reasons. And, and actually, one of those reasons is the presence of occult injuries. What is it? What else can it be if it's not an ankle sprain? And what are the kind of things that we need to be thinking about? Uh, so, Tom, thank you very much. Awesome. Uh, yeah, so that is sort of ties, I think, a lot of that together, actually. So, yeah, my name's Tom Hester. I'm a foot and ankle consultant based at King's. It's my NHS base. Um, no credit for disclosure. So, what I don't want to do is, you know, is, um, so it's easier to suck eggs, right? You, you, if the bone's sticking out through the skin and the ankle's like pointing in the wrong direction, you know it's not an ankle sprain. But foot and ankle issues do have quite a big medical legal component. So it's always worth just thinking about all the other diagnoses at the same time, okay? Not to scare anyone, and you know, these are the sort of lesser common things, but they're still around, you know, 15%, 20% of occult injuries that are missed. And then this these just a couple of slides just uh, reiterate the sort of incidence of medical legal uh, injuries relating to the foot and ankle and you know, Achilles ruptures are on there and how much that costs, right? So just bear that stuff in mind. It's a common, you don't hear hooves and think instantly it's a zebra, it's almost certainly going to be a horse. Lima's covered beautifully the anatomy. Uh, these slides are there. Just for complete for completion, and they're they're also in the recording as well. What I want to do is just give you a structure, some just some red flags to uh, look out for and avoid, and how to avoid a, a sort of common pitfalls. So, you know, there's a traumatic and traumatic, and I guess really that sort of fits into the chronic ones and the uh, acute ones, really, which is what we sort of divided the previous talks about. I just follow on with the age formatic is that that seems what we're going on about recently so um just be mindful you know the elderly one you think they, they're not sure we've all seen them right they they, they say they possibly had an ankle sprain they're not entirely sure they've had an ankle sprain but, it, but something's not right it's still hurting they've seen you know, their jeep or their friend most commonly and they're like oh you're an awesome physio you see go and see them they'll sort you out they, they did for me uh, and you get them and they're sure they've got a bit of pain and things but just you know, if it, uh, it's as Julie said, if it's not settling, it's not quite right. If things don't just quite fit, then just be. It could be something else, right? So this is a um, an osteosarcoma calf, which presents as like heel pain or sort of lateral side of pain because it, it irritates the perineals, it radiates down that lateral side, and it feels not too dissimilar to a sort of chronic ankle sprain. But there's some differences. They have night pain. They have swelling which is ongoing for such a long period of time and then later on they do get some skin changes as well but that that, that part is pretty pretty clear and you probably missed the float at that stage part of my subspecialty interest is a little niche i, I grant you but it is on charco uh, feet which is sort of this um it's where diabetics get this loss of protective protective sense uh, i go I, I guess because my um, my practice is a little specialised on this. I see a lot of these missed injuries. Uh, and the problem is because the sort of diabetics, they don't have the best sensation in their feet. They've lost that 
protective sensation. And they often come with a slight red foot. Again, history is a little vague. Oh, I possibly rat rolled it. You know, I sometimes bang into things often, and I, you know, I miss the stairs and I look unsteady on my feet. So, I'm, you know, it, I probably did injure it. But actually, there's often they don't have any history. They come with a sort of swollen red ankle or red foot, and they don't come like the top X-ray. There, they're not just a massive deformed rock. Or, you know rocker bottom foot which is what people associate with Charcot actually they come with a foot below it. it it's pristine on the x-ray and if you get it now we can save them from developing the top one so the things to look out for there are are they diabetic if they're diabetic you've just got to be thinking Charcot whether or not they're a nice fit healthy type one I see all spectrums this is not a 70 year old diabetic problem this is also the 20 year olds 21 year olds uh, poorly controlled diabetes and again that loss of protective sense and typically they do have a red sort of uh, hot foot young sports people just be wary it could be something else going on as well you know they may have a systemic uh, um, uh, spondylo spondyloarthropathy this is actually written by a uh, Paul Kirkman who's who is a uh, physiotherapist actually he's, he's written this awesome screen demo thing which I'm sure most people on this uh, webinar are familiar with but yeah, just be be um, be mindful and think not just the injury, but uh, I mean, as the other guys were saying, treat the whole patient. And then the traumatic ones. Everyone's familiar with Ottawa. Have they got pain behind, pain at the tip of the base of the fifth metatarsal? You can try and rule out whether it's a fracture, but it's not perfect. Any bruising in the sort of midfoot for the sort of hyperplantar flexion injuries makes you think of a Liz Frank, and that they're missed up to twenty percent of the time. There's, it's it's one of the, even though we're sort of all aware of it, it's still missed. And so you think, well, why is that? How can we still miss it? It's because I think the patients sort of they hobble around a little bit. They don't always have this plantar plantar swelling, but they. If you x-ray them, they they, they, you can see some subtle signs. It's just to be wary. If you see plantar bruising, or it's not just purely in the ankle, it's starting to get towards the midfoot, think Liz, Liz Frank injury. Tip out ruptures, again, so that's a tendon on the, on the front of the ankle. Common in the sort of 50 to mid 60s, they stumble. So it sounds exactly like a, a, a sprained ankle, but actually, when you look a little bit closer, they've lost that contour over the front of the ankle. You can see here on, on the on two images, just here, they've lost that anterior contour. And often, actually, they just they don't actually complain of a huge amount of pain and swelling. They just think, oh, I, you know, my ankle is not quite right, uh, and it's you know you think it maybe it's just a deltoid injury, but actually, just think. Could there be something else going on? Can always compare and contrast. We've got to look at both, uh, and, and you can you can pick these things up. Perineal subluxation. So again, that it, it's missed again. Fifteen to twenty percent of the patients, and it, there's a, a, there's some papers there just to show you this is what it looks like. So you it presents exactly like a lateral ligament injury and is often part of a lateral ligament injury. When you do resistor diversion, you see the perineal tendons click around the front. Sometimes you pick this up acutely, but actually the majority you pick up later on down the line with that that they you know they, they complain of ankle clicking and they're like, oh look, I can sort of like you know spin my ankle and it um, and they feel this sort of sensation of clicking. You think, oh, that's probably just some soft tissue prominence or what have you. And then you look and the perineal tendons are subluxing over the front. So have a, look, have a look. If you think clicking ankle, you've got to just rule out perineal subluxation. And the classic ruptured tendo Achilles. I do some medical legal work. I see this time and time again. You think, how can it happen? But actually, it's not. Always, the ones that are missed aren't your... 20 year old footballer who's playing thinks he's been tackled from behind he's adamant of it he's sure of it. he's told everyone he was tackled he looks behind there's no one there it's actually just the the slightly uh, elderly person they've just tripped down a step again they felt something go they think they've just rolled their ankle they hobble on for a little bit longer again they get referred to physios because that, that's you know, sort of the msk pathways via a telephone consultation by someone somewhere uh, and actually 
when you look at them, they feel, they've got this sort of diffuse swelling, again, a lot of the contour, and if you palpate, you can feel a soft spot. So always look for a positive Simmons and, and palpate the tendon. Oh, Joe's covered this perfectly. So failure to improve is always just, you've just got to be thinking, is there something else going on? Has that location of the pain changed? Was it they had that lateral pain to start off with, but actually now they're like, oh, it's probably a little bit more inside the ankle joint. And then if you can see this x-ray, there's just a subtle osteochondral defect, osteochondral lesion um, there of the, ta of the tailor dome. And that's just the ankle is inverted. They've injured their lateral ligaments and it you know, occurs in 4% of ankle sprains. And then they've just impounded their um, talus onto the tibial profond. Normal x-rays, uh, you, you, we see those again quite a lot, don't you? They say, oh, I've, uh, you particularly, I've been skiing, I went, I had some x-rays, they said they were normal here, I've got them on my phone. Uh, you have a look and you think, oh, okay, yeah, sure, I can't see much there. But then you think, actually, are these normal x-rays? Have you included everything? You see the patient, they're like, well, actually, yeah, I'm swollen on the outside of my ankle, but I'm also a little sore on the inside a bit more painful on the front and some for some reason the top of my leg hurts a little bit as well and I just it's just really really sore and you know it's you've got to always be thinking is there a syndrome particularly if they're still failing you know, they've got a lot of pain and swelling or they're not improving was there a syndesmotic injury that's been missed is there a high fibular fracture is there a mason nerve fracture and again this is missed with surprising frequency a little bit more on the sport specific type things. Again, almost identical to a, a lateral ligament sprain is a lateral tailor process injury. It's just below the tip of the fibula. It's common in snowboarders. Again, like either pick it up straight away or if they're just struggling a little bit, there's a bit more swelling and bruising than you'd expect. They're tender, not quite anterior lateral to the, to the tibia. You have to think of a, of a tailor process fracture. And it's subtle, right? And this x-ray would be, you know, be nine times out of 10 reported as normal. But if you look, you can just see there's some debris down here. They've got, they've got a lateral tailor process fracture. Keys in the history, snowboarder, you've really got to just rule that out, actually. Just make sure it's not being missed. Uh, and like I say, some pain a little bit more distal uh, to the fibula. So just to recap, night pain, it's just red, you know, night pain needs to be investigated. Diabetes, just be really mindful. Is this a Charcot? Yeah, I'm sure it's probably not. It probably just is a simple ankle sprain, but just be wary of it. Plants are bruising. It's a midfoot fracture, midfoot injury until proven otherwise, and it needs referring on. High ankle sprains for those ones that have got sort of unusual pain pattern, or they're just not settling. And then a loss of ankle contour, whether that's the front or the back, Tibans rupture and tendo Achilles rupture, You've got to really rule those out and failure to improve, which we've covered, uh, I think, in, in some awesome detail earlier. And that's it for me. Brilliant. Thanks, Tom. Um, one thing I wanted to ask you about, actually, is, is one of the things that um, I find in some patients is sensitivity of the superficial perineal nerve in the in the severe in the severe sprains. Yeah. Yeah. So so actually, you know, can you um, talk to us about some of your thoughts on that? Yeah, so, did you have that in your lovely slides today? No. I didn't. So, um, what is, um, so one Nima's talking about, and I'm sure you guys have seen this, you get this a, a lot in clinic, people ask you, they're like, oh, but I'm getting some pins and needles or some tingling down my ankle. Is that normal? Do you, do, I'm sure every, everyone's got that. And the reason being, and uh, while well, Nima's just trying to see if he can find, he's got some lovely slides on this, is you get this traction neuropraxia. As you roll your ankle round, the SPN comes down, it, it, so down here. You can almost see it actually on this on this slide. It just sort of comes down there, heading towards the base of the fourth. And when you roll the ankle, because of it comes through just a little um, uh, fascial uh, hernia, a little bit more proximal, you get this traction neuropraxia. So it stretches the nerve, it causes this then stinging and uh, stinging and burning or some sort of numbness down the side uh, of, the, of the foot. And that's, it's actually surprisingly common. I think if you if you ask patients, have you got it, or if you test for it, they find it a lot. 
rare, on very rare occasions, we were, the reason this is coming out is because we were talking about this between ourselves uh, earlier, is um, it, it can cause a problem long term. And then there's uh, some some fancy things you can you can try to, uh, with regards to surgery. Oh, yeah. should I switch you? So on side? if I if I just what I can do is um, um, if you give me if you give me access what I, I think i've had one patient with that previously yeah, it was a real persistent the, the the ankle injury had cleared but they were left with these with burning very n- nervy type symptoms yeah. and i was a little bit like what am i going to do with this but actually it really responded nicely to some neural flossing techniques are just oh, a, yeah, yeah, yeah. It, i mean i just thought it's not for my sciatica but anyway, yeah, yeah exactly yeah, yeah. I, I know i spoke to him like he was like i've got nothing to lose i said look let's just go and try mm. this and actually with that kind of perineal nerve bias it worked really nicely now whether that was that was an n equals one no, you know no, they, but they, it, it yeah it did work nicely also, they, they do tend to settle don't they like mm-hmm. the majority do 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 yeah. totally fine, right? Oh, it was, no, yeah. it was all me. Yeah, no, no, sorry. Um, <laughs> under the right supervision is what I meant to say. Not, not they, they just do fine. Yeah. <laughs> so a couple of things in, in my mind, you know, one of the things that um, is is critical from my point of view, let me, let me just show this. So I think you can all see that now. So, so there's a couple of things here. So if we look at the territories that we're talking about, this sort of olive green area is the territory of the superficial perineal nerve. And back here is the, the pink on the posterior aspect is the sural nerve. Now, one of the things that I find is, is which is which is really important is to actually um, so that we know is to make the diagnosis because patients come to you and they have pain that they cannot quite identify. They can't put it in a box. They can't relate the pain that they have to some of the activities that they do and also the injury that they've had. Okay, And having that disconnect between the pain and what else is going on is it feeds into the psychological aspects and the education that you were talking about. Sometimes recognizing that the neuropraxia that they've got is likely to be temporary is likely to settle down with some very simple maneuvers that you can teach them. And it is not related to them doing horrendous injury to themselves each time they feel it has a profound effect on the way that they then go on to feel that pain and actually the psychological burden of those symptoms. Yeah, absolutely. But it takes away the fear, hopefully. That's what we're trying to do, isn't it? That's right. That's right. So I'm just going to look to see we've got no questions on the chat. So one thing that we might do is we were going to uh, demonstrate some things about the examination of the syndesmosis. So one of the um, problems about the high ankle sprain is that it is not particularly common. Um, it's an unusual injury, but it is an un- it's an injury that takes exactly as you were saying. It takes much longer to settle down and is much more likely to require surgical intervention for stabilization. So what we'll do now is that we will do a a little session examining uh, on the couch to try and show some of the nuances of the examination of the syndesmosis. To go back to the examination of the syndesmosis, um, comparison of two sides is important. Next thing is to actually understand the anatomic position of the syndesmosis. So we have the lateral malleables, the medial malleables. You see that. That little bump there is the lateral aspect and the lateral aspect of the dermal table. And in fact, what you can see here is that that line there, I don't really think you can see it long, but that little line there is actually a superficial perineal nerve, which is great further. And you can see as the foot goes further around, that is why it gets on stretch and causes problems. So the next thing is that when we examine the symptoms, some blogginess and pain will tear there. Is actually uh, something to do. And then I'll look at some uh, the specific things in the history that I asked about two things. One is to ask what the ankle feels like when you push off to sprint for the bus or to you know jump up the stair. The other one is that what the foot feels like when you land on tiptoes on the side that has got a problem. What tends to happen is that individuals feel that sensation of instability particularly over the actual athletes in the ankle, doing those particular moves.
for the medical examination of the sensors, there are a number of different tests that have been uh, described. So one of them is just a nice thing. So you'll see fetching the ankle, holding the knee, and then externally rotating against the lateral side of the tissue. Again, what happens is that sensations of instability in the pain are felt across the lateral side. There is also the calf compression. So you compress the fibula against the tibia up here, and people find that, that they get the pain in that area. That's not a test that I found in taking this. One dynamic test that I do is then to get the, get the individual to do a single leg hop. Can I, can I hand you this here? <laughs> the way to, and the way I'm so very clear is that I want you to hang on to something. You yeah. don't trust me to injure yourself, <laughs> not to injure yourself. You then go on to one foot and then just gently, you don't even have to go off the ground right, just a tiny bit to see it. Yeah? Perfect, that's it, just a few of those, and then I start to sit down. And what that does is simulates stressing the synthesis in a dynamic mode. Right? The next thing I do is I get some videotape or um, elastic pass and I wrap very tight just the garden level of the bad heels. That's really really tight. And, and what I tell the patients is look, it's going to feel odd, you're not going to like it. But the key thing is that whenever that sensation is the ability that you have, I want you to do that again. So you wrap the tape around, you then get them to do the single leg hop. They think about it, and then you take the tape off, and they do the single leg hop again. So that they've had the, 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 just the broad sensation of what it feels like to externally stabilize the synthesis. And I think that's actually quite an important thing for the, for the patient to recognize. The, the, what the ankle will feel like in the state of the state. So that basically, you know, the lead decision making is am I going to operate with you? And then what I would like to achieve from an operation is that going to make your ankle feel different? Okay. So, what are your thoughts on that? Yeah, very similar. So, as you said, there are so many tests out there. Okay. So, and none of them have great tests. On their own, so I used to say I used to have three or four problems. So, definitely, our patient in I used to dorsal flexion, so I'm a patient of two years. But I've also kind of made up my own kind of rehabilitation test. So, if you ever stand up, so instead of tape, I just use my hands. So, if you just lunge forward, so if you think quite anatomically, when he lunges forward, that wider anterior lip tails like back and forth technically. So ask him, what's that feel like? Does it feel hard? It tends to be more odd sensations rather than pain. And then I get him to back off, and then instead of the tape, I'm just keeping. So you the same thing to play it and get into the feet up here in the tummy pool where that's it. So does that feel different? Does it feel better? Does it stable? So it's very simple as the whole case. Not quite as much low product is available for acute injuries. But I found that that often just all adds to my index of suspicion of is this something I want more to repeat with you before I go head first into my three month screen now? Really? So, um, but yeah, they're kind of the uh, patients that I find that really that's that is the simplest the first one for me to get to be. And also the history, finding higher velocity of the What causes ankle ligament laxity? Right, Tom, what, what, what are your thoughts on that? Ankle ligament, yeah. <laughs> so, well, did the you have to correct me now. But anyway, so, <laughs> my thoughts on it are, so they typically, it's um, not like uh, Achilles as well, is they don't, they don't get, uh, sorry, I tell you, I was talking about once they've uh, roll, injured their ankle and then they, rather than sort of hypermobility syndrome. So we'll go with a sort of post-traumatic um, ankle laxity, ankle lateral ligament laxity. So the, Typically, the reason is you rather than sort of being cut like, like a pair of scissors or even a knife, and so it's a nice, uh, sort of clean, sharp edge that then he, uh, you know, that can then heal perfectly 
uh, together again, so you don't get any uh, increase in length or, or laxity in the ligaments. What tends to happen actually is it, it sort of frays, um, and then you get this sort of attenuation, so it becomes longer, and then that just gives you that gives you laxity um, because you're you've lost that sort of resting tension in in the ligament itself. So that's why why you get that why you get that sort of increased laxity. On the flip side of that, sometimes you get increased scarring, and so that makes everything a little bit stiff on the front of the ankle, but then lax on the side of the ankle. And that, that's a slightly difficult problem to deal with, which is where, where yourselves come in with uh, physio and working with all of those things to try and get them uh, back in action. But have you got any other? You, no, no, I entirely agree, because ligaments is like two mop ends that have been yeah. drawn out of each other, and then they heal long. Yeah. Uh, and in fact, uh, you know, part of the using the splints and so on is to try and maintain ankle position. So the scarring that occurs hopefully ha occurs with the with the ligament in the right kind yeah. of tension. Uh, let me have um, got one. views on orthotics. I think. Yeah, I've got a couple. Your three on orthotics. <laughs> I mean, I think my view on orthoses it depends. So the time I tend to use it is if on my assessment I've maybe picked up they might have a bit of a subtle pes cavus yeah, look yeah, like. Yeah. You know. So thinking about more chronic, is that been a predisposing factor that they've come to us with chronic ankle instability? Um, also alongside perineal tendinopathy, that kind of picture. And then I find just to try, I mean, Ian Griffiths, the great podiatrist, kind of gave me this tip of just doing a full length um, varus wedge just to take the pressure off. And actually that can give them real symptomatic relief while you rehab them. I mean, they've had Pez Cavus feet forever. It's not necessarily that I want to send them to you for huge reconstructive surgery, but it buy me time to strengthen and make them more resilient with their rehab to then get them back on track. So that's kind of the only time with these type of patients I tend to use orthoses. Yeah, for me, it's, it's just exactly right. So so what you've talked about there and, and the, way that, the way I think about it is that there is a specific pathology that you want to correct to then achieve the, the end that you want. So pes cavus is one. Some patients who've got, again, pes planus, so they've got very flat feet, and that is that is causing a problem such as, you know, lateral pillar impingement and so on in, in combination. So so I think that it, it's, it has to be very specific ones. Now, interestingly, one of the other things is, is that what is being found is just a simple medial arch support in non-elite athletes who do long distance running reduces the incidence of all sorts of injuries in mm -hmm. the foot. So then that's a, that's a bit of a separate question really, isn't it? To, you know, what do you do in individuals? Do you just provide the orthosis or the orthotics for the purpose of mitigating longer term injuries, which we have good evidence for? Um, I think all good questions. I don't really have a particular answer. I look, I look at the specific individual and try and see if there is what it is that we need to address to get them on the right path. I love the Q, the Q and A's. I love it. Uh, there's a quick one there on foot drop. Uh, I'm, I'm unsure if you mean then uh, it's like the patient got a common perineal nerve palsy or a tibian rupture or a spinal pathology that developed a foot drop. In which case. There's, if that is one of those things and, and the, the diagnosis for a foot drop has been achieved and you just wonder how to manage it rather than doing like a tendon transfer or an ankle fusion, then sure, an AFO is a totally reasonable thing to consider as a you know as an ankle foot orthosis, um, which can help with a foot drop. But I think the key thing with foot drops is to ensure you know why, it, why they've got it, is all I would say. Um, have you guys got anything to add to that? No. no, 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 no. So there's a couple of very specific ones coming up. Uh, what about David's question? So there's one above that, I think. Yeah. What are the what are the differential diagnoses for multiple MTBJ joint pain in 70 year olds? With mill trauma, normal x-rays, the patient has restricted range of movement but is able to perform basic ADLs tip to toe. Would it suggest a referral for further investigation? 
Yeah, no, because there, there, there could be a yeah, multiplicity of reasons. No, there's, there's, there could be, there's, uh, there could be a number of reasons. Usually, forefoot pain is associated with Achilles tightness, so that's the first thing to look at. In a seventy-year-old, it is unusual. The next thing is that you get loss of the fat pad and the the thickness of the of the plantar um, fat in in individuals as they age. Also, there is an association with loss of that fat pad with inflammatory conditions. So is it those? And then the next thing, actually, in older individuals, we have to think about particularly metatarsal head pain, whether they have a plantar plate abnormality and whether that is the cause. So in this case, this is a perfect example of needing an exact diagnosis and actually using appropriate footwear to stop the pain, the foot being painful, because they can do everything. I can't functionally make them better with intervention. It's just making sure that we're not missing something and then providing them with appropriate footwear to mitigate that pain and allow them to do their daily activities. Um, the next question is, um, is a really good one. David's one following. So in the past, we used to immobilize people in plasters for weeks and weeks. And now we go for early rehab. I mean, I'm very much in favour of early rehab. Mm. Uh, I think from a physio point of view, what are your thoughts on that? So, again, depending on the severity of the injury, if there is significant laxity, or, I mean, it's they may need immobilisation. No, we, we're talking about, this is post-reconstruction. Oh, we, post oh, you know, no, the so, if I can have them, the better. Because <laughs> even with physio, so I'm not stressing the lateral ligaments. I'm allowing them to to heal but there's so much else that we can do in terms of that early rehab so maintaining dorsiflexion plantar flexion the proximal stabilizers yeah so they tend to come to me um i'm seeing them I'm trying to think when rick sends them to me they're normally a couple of weeks post-op and yeah. i'm just starting so, to I mean, i'm much the same actually so is a, is, a, is a period of time where you allow the wound to settle down before yes. you then get going yeah before they let us loose what yeah. about what about the acute situation so what are your thoughts about sort of immobilization because we actually have a little bit of evidence on that as well really yeah. 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 yeah again if it's severe mm. then they've actually bothered to come to physio then yeah. i probably would immobilize them for the first seven yeah 14 days yeah and then i use the same air cuff splint that you use i like those so it's still protecting the lateral ligaments but allowing that normal dorsiflexion mm -hmm. range of movement so they don't stiffen up too much that for me is a happy medium agreed and you know one of the things that i would say about that is that um all ligaments heal with scarring and this scarring is an incredibly dynamic tissue what tends to happen is that the uh, fibroblasts that lay down the scar tissue have mechanoceptors. They are sensitive to the direction of load that goes across them. And as they lay down the scar tissue, they will lay the fibers down along the direction of load. So in fact, you get your scar tissue aligned in the direction that you want your ligament to eventually be. So you so need to put that, some stress through it. Exactly yeah. right. Without that stress, it's haphazard. Yeah. And actually, it's much like the Achilles tendon reconstruction and Achilles tendon rehabilitation that we now have, which is an accelerated rehabilitation. And it is all around trying to ensure we have appropriate alignment of the fibers of the scar tissue to add strength to that, uh, to the structure. And that kind of go. We were talking earlier around, you know, we were talking about rice mm. principles and in the um, review of guidance. And that actually probably in physio we more moved towards police as an acronym, so protection and optimal loading rather than the R for rest. Mm. Just because with our patients, that has again a psychological different connotation of what we're allowing them to do. So I tend to. Yeah, it just gives, it's another way of saying ligaments need to move in the presence of movement. Otherwise, they're going to forget how to be a ligament, aren't they? Entirely agree. Entirely agree. Um, there's one more. Who's just saying about, um, so from my experience with podiatrists, the suggestion has always been long term use of orthotics, no exercise to improve muscle, tendon, uh, or ligament strength, etc. Uh, I mean, we we work me and I and that's what I did, we work mm. pretty closely with a lot of orthotics. I think maybe that 
that may just be a, um, a sort of like a niche uh, time with that particular orthotics. I, I think a lot of uh, like like it's like us with physios, with with everyone, it's a team sport, right? And we've all got. A, if we all work together, we tend to get awesome outcomes. And I think there's definitely a role for uh, the orthotist and a podiatrist in combination with all of us. So maybe it was a, a one-off. We'll give them the benefit of the doubt this time. <laughs> and I think MSK podiatry is not quite as established as. You know, it, it's still growing and evolving, isn't it? And there are podiatrists out there that have a real passion for this and they do absolutely advocate exercises. The podiatrist I work with, she's very much like, you know, I give the orthoses so that your rehab can work. Yes. And I don't give them all singing or dancing. They are quite, you know, just they're customized they look a bit blue peter sometimes but because i want them to fall apart after yeah. six months because by then they shouldn't need them anymore yeah so it's yeah it's majority of them i say now are definitely looking at muscle tendons strength and working with us as a team 100 percent. fantastic well I think we're slowly coming to, to an end. Um, I, I just wanted to thank all of our audience for staying with us to the bitter end and uh, asking some really good questions. Um, Jodie, thank you very much for your time. It's been, it's been actually really good to have the physiotherapy insight. We don't always have it in these talks, but I think it's really important because it's, it's, it's the way that you think about it and even some of the examination that you showed us, I think I will have it in my practice. Um, <laughs> And uh, Tom, thank you very much for telling us what to do when it's <laughs> not an ankle sprain. Yeah, um, no, those are mine. I'd like to thank um, Nuffield Health for giving us the opportunity to broadcast this webinar. The, it will be available and you can watch it later on because this is all recorded. Um, and thank you very much for joining us. Mm -hmm.